Good afternoon. Welcome to our second rewilding planet Earth event of the semester with Pete Malinowski from the Billion Oyster Project. My name is Heather Olins. I'm a faculty member in the biology department and environmental studies program. Uh, this series has been an important component of uh, my classes this semester and last semester, and it has really been a pleasure and an honor to be part of the team bringing you all these events, which is uh, the rewilding planet Earth lecture series, which is supported by a grant from the Institute for Liberal Arts. Um, Tara did such a great job introducing the series at our last event that I'm just going to borrow some of her words. Um, Rewilding Planet Earth invites us to take seriously the biodiversity extinction crisis, to think critically and differently about our relationship with nature, and to participate in the UN Decade for Ecosystem Restoration. The series emphasizes both the need to be an, as informed as possible and to stay engaged through shared action, community engage, involvement, and a commitment to the common good all of which I think are exemplified by the Billion Oyster Project. I invite you to follow the Rewilding Planet Earth series, which can be found on the ILA website. Our next event is March 16th with ecologist Nalini Nankarni. This is going to be a virtual event, so you need to register ahead of time. So keep that in mind as you disappear for spring break. Um, and you can find more information on the series website. The format for this event it will be two shorter presentations with a good amount of time after each one for, uh, for conversation and questions. I know Pete's really counting on us to engage and ask questions, so, so please, please, please do that. Um, and we have microphones at the front and the back for those questions. It's a small enough room that we might not need them, but that will help for the recording, because this event is being recorded. Uh, Billion Oyster Project is a nonprofit organization on a mission to restore oyster reefs to New York Harbor through public education initiatives. Together with the local community, Billion Oyster Project has planted 47 million oysters across 12 acres and 15 reef sites across New York Harbor, engaging more than 8,000 New York students and 10,000 volunteers to date. Founded on the belief that restoration without education is temporary and observing that learning outcomes improve when students have the opportunity to work on real restoration projects, uh, Billion Oyster Project collaborates with public schools. The crew designs STEM curriculum for New York City schools through the lens of oyster restoration and engages Urban Assembly New York Harbor School students on large-scale restoration projects, collects discarded oyster shells from 75 New York City restaurants, and engages local community in the stewardship of their local marine environment. Billion Oyster Project also has a Boston College connection. The Director of Development, Brian Rieger, is a proud alumnus, which we did not know when we started um, trying to put this event together. Pete Malinowski is the co-founder and executive director of Billion Oyster Project. He grew up farming oysters with his parents and siblings on the Fishers Island Oyster Farm. His passion for the environment and education led him to the New York Harbor School, where he found, founded the school's aquaculture and oyster restoration programs and spent five years as a teacher. Pete serves as a co-chair of the Governor's Shellfish Restoration Council and sits on the Mayor's Waterfront Management Advisory Board. Pete spends as much of his free time as possible on the water or in the woods with his three children. Please join me in welcoming Pete. All right. Thank you all so much for having me. I love the, I mean, you gave basically my presentation, so you know most everything now. And the, um, I love the uh, concept for the series. Makes perfect sense. And I'm very interested. So I'm going to take this opportunity to share with you all about Billion Oyster Project, but I'm also hoping to learn from you because I'm on a mission to try to understand what it takes to motivate people to care about the, natu the natural world and change their behaviors in a way that supports that. So I'm going to ask you some questions, and I'm hoping that you will, some of you will volunteer to answer them. So the first is easy. It's a hand raise. Wondering how many of you identify as being environmentalists? So just about all. Okay, the second one is how many of you think that you have the power to change the world? Smaller number. I like the maybe yes, maybe no. Um, okay, so the, the, now this is now I want to hear from you all. So I'm wondering. I'd like all of you to think about, since you are all, all identify as environmentalists, if there was a moment or a place, particularly interested in the place, that was fun foundational or fundamental in establishing your environmental ethic. So take a minute, think about it. I want to share some stories so you all can think about some stories or some place that you want to share. And all you need to do when you're ready is raise your hand. I haven't taught in a long time. 
Yes, sir. Awesome. Yes. Where's the beach town? So that that's an interesting example in that it's a sort of beautiful natural space, but also one that was impacted by a weather event and so it's witnessing that change. There's two of you right there in the back. Um, Do you want to? Anyone else? All right. So I, I heard one thing sort of ring throughout all of those, and that was access. Right? All of you who shared, and I wouldn't be surprised if all of you who have memories of natural places had the privilege of accessing those natural places and, and had that be fundamental in building your environmental ethic. It was the same for me, right? And our, the story that I'm going to share with you today about New York City and New York Harbor is one where th that access isn't there for, for most people who live in New York City, and particularly young people. And as we go, as we lose contact with nature, as we become increasingly urbanized, and school becomes increasingly homogenized, and we learn more and more through screens, indoors, in classrooms, and less and less out in the field, those connections are fewer and farther between. And I personally think that those connections are the key to saving the world. We want to protect and preserve the natural world. We have to find ways to form authentic connections with nature for as many people as possible. Because that's what set me on my path, and all of you are sitting here today for similar reasons. Um, so that's a, a big sort of overlaying context on how we do our work at Billion Oyster Project, is try to find innovative ways to connect people with nature in a place that you wouldn't normally associate with connections to nature. New York Harbor for me, I spent a ton of time on the harbor, very fortunate to have access to a boat through work. And that's like my happy place in New York City is being out on a boat. And um, my, the New York Harbor I know is one that's full of seabirds, has dolphins, occasional whales, big flocks of gannets, huge schools of bluefish, um, you know, ibises, ospreys, all these animals that you associate with these sort of more rural places, like the place that I grew up. But that all exists in New York Harbor. But most people in New York City don't think about that or don't, don't have access to it. So a big part of our work is trying to create that, that, those access points. I'm hoping you will all think of questions as I go through these you know, 20 or so slides. Um, I'm going to talk about each, each individual one, share a little bit about Billion Oyster Project, but there's layers and layers of detail. So if anything that I talk about makes you curious, think about it, write it down, and we'll have plenty of time to talk. That, that should be the most fun and most interesting part after the slideshow. So I'm counting on you all to think of good questions. Let's see if I can, here we go. So I grew up on Fishers Island, New York, which is a tiny six mile long island east of Long Island. It's one of the most spectacular, beautiful places that I've ever been. And I grew, up, I grew up on an oyster farm. So this is a tiny community, 200 year round residents. It's really rural. It's a summer community. There's a lot of people, fancy houses, people come out during the summertime. But the year round population is, is small. 
and there's um, you know it's a lot of caretakers, landscape people who who take care of these big houses, and then an oyster farm. I grew up as one of six siblings, and we all worked on the farm growing up. And at a very young age, I I was never a very successful student. I made it through college, but I was, I, I was always frustrated in, in school and trouble paying attention. But I loved learning on the oyster farm. I would you know at the end of the school day, would run down to help my dad on the boats all, every weekend, all over the summer, all the school breaks, I was working on the farm. And while I was barely passing my biology classes in school, I was doing all this complex biology work in the oyster hatchery. I was identifying different species of phytoplankton, diagnosing oyster diseases, doing, you know, um, determining the density of different cultures and changing food ratios, watching oysters reproduce, watching cells divide. I had this sort of complex understanding of how to operate these systems while like barely making it through my high school classes. And that was a theme for me sort of um, all, all through college. It's like my favorite learning experience, my favorite educational experience was always working on the farm. And that was an incredible privilege to have. So I had this training ground, learning ground, and, and got to understand how, how you can uh, use natural systems and produce a product that has value in the market without harming the natural world, right? Oyster farms grow oysters without added food, pesticides, fresh water, electricity, herbicides, you know, any of that stuff. It's one of the most sustainable forms of protein on the planet. And so being able to interact with that system was hugely important for me growing up and led to the development of Billion Oyster Project. The other thing I'd say is when I go home now, still, when I go take the boat from Connecticut to Fisher's Island to go home and you look out at Fisher's Island Sound, which is this beautiful place, I feel like that's mine. Like I have a, 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 a piece of ownership over that common space. And that's another thing that we're working in New York City to, um, to support for students and for volunteers, that we have this giant open space in the middle of New York City, New York Harbor, and we call it our commons. It, it belongs to all New Yorkers. And finding ways to build ownership for students is really important. And you can watch that on the faces of our students as they go through our programs, go from looking out over the harbor as something foreign that doesn't belong to them, by the time they graduate from harbor school, seeing the harbor as theirs. And um, so I'll show you how we do that. It also has to do with rewilding. So starting with the wilding, before the rewilding, this is an image from Manhattan to Eric Sanderson's book about New York City before Europeans arrived. It's missing the animals. Maybe it's zoomed out too far. But this is, this is Manhattan, East River, Hudson River, and uh, what it looked like before Europeans arrived. When Europeans arrived, they found a harbor that was completely full of animals. So they wrote home from the, from the ships. They wrote back to Europe and said, we'll never need to go to Sweden again for stockfish. There are more fish here than we could ever possibly eat. And describe being able to catch fish just by lowering a basket over the side of the boat and hauling it back up full of fish. So that means that there were too many fish in New York Harbor to physically get out of the way of a moving basket. They also described not being able to see the sky for minutes at a time because of, there were so many birds flying overhead. Right, so that type of abundance doesn't exist anywhere on Earth anymore. None of us, none of our grandparents has, have ever seen anything like that because it's all been removed by people. And the way that happened in New York Harbor was by harvesting all the oysters. That was the first most significant impact on the natural environment. And it only took European colonists about 100 years to harvest all the wild oysters from the harbor. Oyster reefs are just like coral reefs. They provide food and habitat for hundreds of other species. They filter the water. They stabilize the bottom, they protect the shores from wave events and, and storms. And without the oyster reefs, you don't have the ecosystem. It's the same as if you have a forest and you chop down all the trees. So this giant open space, instead of being this complex ecosystem with all these different animals, is just a flat, featureless landscape. And what happened in New York is uh, everyone loved the oysters. So pretty early on, oysters were a food that was enjoyed by rich and poor alike. They were, there were oyster carts on every corner. You could buy half a dozen oysters for a penny. New Yorkers at one point averaged 600 oysters per person per year. 
I don't know. I mean, I'm probably the only one here who's still up there. I don't know if you guys <laughs> keep up like that. But, um, and, and they were also shipped all over the world. So people in Europe would come to New York City to try the oysters, and oysters from New York City would get shipped in barrels, salted and shipped in barrels to Europe, which also sounds disgusting, but uh, to be consumed in Europe. And as the technology improved, you pretty quickly went through that, uh, that native oyster supply. This just, you can just see some of the, the scale of the harvest just by the shell piles. And uh, streets were paved with oyster shells. Buildings were built out of oyster shells. It was a additive for cement. And one of the big problems that happened, um, and I should say this is not just a New York City problem. This happened in New York Harbor, in Boston Harbor, in Charleston Harbor, the entire Chesapeake Bay, all up and down the East Coast, in Australia, in you know Miami. At, all throughout the world, oyster reefs were destroyed in the same way. And, um, and all around the same time, over 90% of oyster reefs worldwide have been destroyed by humans. So compared to oyster reefs, coral reefs are doing great. Does anyone have any guesses why we hear about oyster, uh, coral reefs and coral reef care and protection a lot more than we hear about oyster reefs? I have some theories, I don't know the answer. Because you can farm them, so it's food. It's, anyone else? That's a good one. I think, yeah. Yep. So brightly colored fish, clear water makes a big difference. Um, another key reason is that 22 of the largest 30 cities in the world are built on temperate estuaries that used to have thriving oyster populations. So there's a use conflict. You think of tropical coral reefs are more often in less populated areas, whereas the biggest cities in the world are often built on former oyster reef habitat. So New York City is interesting in that it's emblematic of that use conflict. Uh, but if you, you you can also think about coral reefs as oases and deserts. There's so little food in the water, and there are these high concentrations of life and all these brightly colored fish. But a temperate estuary is the most productive ecosystem on the planet. So there's more biomass per cubic meter in a temperate estuary than any other ecosystem. And so the ability of an oyster reef in New York Harbor to add fish to the ocean is far, far greater than a tropical system. And so, but we don't, we don't get the love because of the, the colors and the clear water and the cities. That's the big thing. So in, uh, by harvesting all the shells and removing them for, from the system, you also break the life cycle of an oyster. So oysters are, they have a free swimming larval phase. Uh, so the eggs are fertilized in the water, they swim around and then um, will settle out and attach to something after about two weeks. And they need a hard substrate to attach to, and they prefer oyster shells. They prefer live oysters over anything else to attach to. But without the shells, the oysters have nowhere to land. So every year when they reproduce, those little larvae go swimming around and only find the mud and then die. So that was a big, that's another big problem and why the native oyster population was what um, went to zero so fast. The other big problems, which you can see in the bottom two slides, is uh, use conflicts and pollution. So the harbors were used as a, the rivers and harbor were used as a system of waste conveyance and a and a trash can, and the island of Manhattan actually expanded um, because of trash that was essentially just trash and sewage that was essentially just poured off the sides, and that allowed the island to grow, the piers to grow, and created new land, and a lot of that uh, new land in Manhattan just built on everything from human waste, dead horses, horse waste, um, trash, and everything else just built out that way. And that worked for a little while until we had used all the fresh water in New York City. So the population growth in New York City was limited by access to fresh water. It ran all the wells dry and the city stopped growing. And then in the mid 1800s, we built this aqueduct system to get fresh water from the Catskills into the city and that allowed the population to explode. And at that time, New Yorkers actually used 10 times as much water per capita as any other city in the world. And that meant 
running water for the first time, flush toilets for the first time, dishwashing and all that stuff, and it all went right out into the harbor. And that was long after the oyster reefs had been, had been removed. But oyster cultivation was a big thing in New York for about 100 years. The oysters tasted so good and had such a, there was such a market for New York Harbor oyster reefs, oysters that it made sense to ship oysters up from the Chesapeake Bay and the Delaware Bay, plant them on New York Harbor beds, and then uh, grow them for a year and sell them. And so the, the oyster um, business continued even after the native, the native populations have been wiped out. But with all that sewage running off into the harbor, in the early 1900s, people started getting sick. And that was just when our understanding of infectious disease was starting to evolve. And, and th those illnesses, the typhoid and cholera, were traced back to the oyster reefs. It came as a big surprise to New Yorkers that pouring raw sewage on your food supply was a problem. The uh, oysters, of course, got blamed for causing the issue. And the last oyster reefs got shut, the last oyster leases got shut down in, in like the early 1920s. And from 1920, to the passage of the Clean Water Act in 1972, the, the uh, water quality just got worse and worse. And so there's a, New York City went from being a place where people swam in the, in the water, got food from the water, went, to the, went down to the harbor to relax and enjoy like, the beautiful view, to a city that was disgusted by its waterways. And you can see that legacy in the, in the, uh, real, the way real estate has developed around New York City and where different types of uses are, are, are close to the water based on the time period. But there was a time in New York where it was disgusting to be near the water. It smelt bad, it looked bad, it was full of trash. There were you know, giant noxious bubbles bubbling up from the bottom, oil sheens everywhere, bodies, you name it. And we still carry that legacy. And so if you ask a New Yorker, an average New Yorker walking on the street, what's the East River like, or what's, a new, new, what's New York Harbor like, they'll say it's toxic, it's polluted, and it's not safe to touch. The reality is that since the passage of the Clean Water Act, 1972, the water quality has improved dramatically. And so the harbor is actually safe to swim in most days of the year. So as long as it hasn't rained, it's safe to swim in. And it's interesting, um, hearing your response is my first question, because if I ask, I, I, I ask the same questions actually on Sunday to a much older generation of people in their 70s, and their connections to becoming environmentalists were all associated with things that led to the Clean Water Act. The Cuyahoga River catching on fire, lead and gasoline, it being dangerous to be outside because of direct threats to human health that were going on. And so it's really interesting to see how that has shifted. And when we think about what it takes to save the planet, what it takes to change the rules, we don't have, as a movement, the benefit of those very dramatic things. Um, so, we, so I think we should uh, refer back to those early memories and try to create those opportunities for more people. But anyway, New York City. Most streets end at the water's edge. Most New Yorkers don't identify as living on the water. The, or living in a port city or living surrounded by a natural resource. The harbor is the same size as the city, just over 200,000 acres. It's the largest open space in New York. It can once again support oyster larvae, seahorses, all these cool animals, and it's safe to swim in more than half the year. But you still have the separation between the city and the harbor. And so what we set out to do by creating Billion Oyster Project is solve that problem, is how can you restore habitat in the harbor and use that process as a way to reconnect New Yorkers to the natural space around them. And this is how we do it. So we, our goal is to engage 1 million people in restoring 1 billion oysters by 2035. And we think that a billion oysters is the level of intervention that's necessary to get the oyster population to a point where it can grow on its own. So put enough oysters in the water so that we could step away and the population would continue to increase. Because of the over-harvesting and water quality problems in the harbor, the oysters were functionally extinct. So you, you did not see recruitment, you did not see young oysters anywhere well, in a few places, but the vast majority of the harbor you did not see oysters. The one million people represents one in 10 New Yorkers by 2035. And th that's the level of intervention that we think is necessary to, to elevate the harbor 
in the collective consciousness of all New Yorkers. So what does it take for all New Yorkers to think differently, or the average New Yorker, whatever that is, to think differently about the harbor? We think that if one in 10 New Yorkers participate directly in restoring oysters to New York Harbor, that we can shift that dynamic. All Billion Oyster pro projects started out of the New York Harbor School. New York Harbor School students do a lot of the heavy lifting of restoring oysters to the harbor. Harbor School is a career and technical education high school, public high school located on Governor's Island, right in the center of the harbor. Anyone, any eighth grader in New York can go to Harbor School. It's a lottery system to get in, and students come from all over New York City. It's one of the most diverse schools in the city for that reason. The average commute of Harbor School students to lower Manhattan to take the 10 minute ferry ride and the 10 minute walk to get to school is an hour. So students come from all, all over the place, well, all in the city, but just to get out to, to the school. Um, after your freshman year, you specialize in one of seven marine fields. So students can choose to specialize in aquaculture, vessel operations, marine biology, ocean engineering, professional scuba diving, marine policy, environmental advocacy, and uh, one more that I'm not thinking of. Um, never remember which ones I've said. But one of the reasons we've developed Billion Oyster Project as a way for the students in those dis different disciplines to work together. It started out of the aquaculture program, which you can see aquaculture students here, and that's I taught aquaculture at Harbor School for five years. And then we realized that you didn't just need students growing oysters, but you also needed students who could drive boats and students who could design underwater structures and students who could weld and scuba dive. And so we, uh, billion, the oyster restoration went from a program of the aquaculture class to a program of all those different career and tech ed programs. Here, aquaculture students are measuring the oysters that they, they grew and restored under the Manhattan Bridge. This is in Brooklyn Bridge Park. Um, so they can go back to that site for monitoring to see how those oysters are doing. Students in the welding program make, make our reef structures. And we design our reef structures out of steel to provide that experience for students. We could use a different reef construction technique, but we want, we want the reef construction techniques to support the learning goals of the students at Harbor School. So we use steel for that, for that purpose. And you could... Uh, could have been a Harbor School student. I could not have been a Harbor School student. Okay, so in addition to Harbor School, Harbor School is about 600 students. And one of the reasons we started Billion Oyster Project was to broadcast that style of teaching and learning to as many schools as possible. So we work primarily with middle schools. We work with about 100 middle schools in all five boroughs all throughout New York. And it's essentially a, a train the trainer model for changing what teaching and learning looks like in New York City. When you, all, when you guys were in middle school, how many of you saw, when you were learning about how nutrients flow through an ecosystem, how many of you saw a picture of a prairie dog, a snake, and a hawk, and like some grass? Everybody, right? That's what I saw. That's what students in New York, in New York City still see, that same picture, that same basic food web picture. And we're trying to shift that to when you're learning about how nutrients flow through an ecosystem, you're looking at lobsters, crabs, ospreys, oysters, oyster toadfish, black sea bass, um, dolphins, all the animals that actually live in the place where we live. And so we do that by developing curricula for middle schools. We've developed a sixth through eighth grade STEM curriculum that can be used for, that, that, that meets the learning goals that teachers are tasked with teaching their students anyway and also involves oysters, oyster restoration, New York Harbor, the pollution issues affecting the harbor, and our work to restore it as part of their lessons. The students also get a, uh, the schools also get an oyster research station, which is a simple wire box filled with live oysters that serves as a focal point for all of that in school teaching and learning. So if students are monitoring water quality at the water's edge, They'll do that a couple times a year, but they'll, there, there are lessons to support that field activity. So in the classroom, they're learning the factors that affect water quality, the physical chemical properties of water, you know, how the um, ammonia is, comes from the wastewater treatment plants. And they learn that in the classroom and then come out a few times a year, measure their oysters, identify the live animals that are attached to the cages, 
see how many of the oysters are, have survived, measure water quality and, and site conditions, and then all of that information is reported back to a central dashboard so students in the Bronx can compare their data with students in Staten Island, draw conclusions from that, and then come together once a year for a research symposium on Governor's Island, which is always my favorite day of the year because there'll be four or 500 10 to 12 year olds who are all fired up about oysters and arguing about whose oysters grew the fastest and why and what, what caused this to happen and all with their poster presentations. It's a really cool day. Um, and then for the last two years, everything has changed for everybody, as you well know. And uh, we've had to bring a lot of our educational content online to support teachers who are teaching remotely for the first time and families who had their kids at home for the first time. So my three kids were home for a full school year. And when that started, nobody knew how to teach, how to do remote school for a, at that point, eight and six year old. Um, and uh, it turns out that looking at an iPad all day is not developmentally appropriate for a six year old. So they had to try to figure out new ways to do it. And so we tried to develop content that took some of our hands-on learning ethos into the virtual environment. It was a really cool exercise to learn how to do and develop that skill, but it was also sort of heartbreaking because we worked so hard to find ways to bring people together and pull people out of their classrooms and out of their apartments down to the water's edge that this was kind of a, a like swift kick into the future that we weren't ready for. Um, but it's, it did allow us to grow our reach in a big way. So that was helpful. All right, field station. So outside of um, middle schools, in school programming, we have field stations at remote sites throughout the city. New York City has over 500 miles of coastline. Almost all of it is cut off, is inaccessible to the public. So it's cut off because it has a railway or a fence or some sketchy industrial blocks or a vertical bulkhead. Um, there's very few places where you can walk down to the water's edge. And the add to that the uh, relative level of accessibility based on the neighborhood in New York City, and you understand a much more complex problem. One way to look at that is to look at the, at the Harlem River, which cuts between Manhattan and the Bronx. Northern, the northern side of, of Man, the, the northern tip of Manhattan is a lot more affluent than the South Bronx and a lot more white. And the north side of the south side of the Harlem River, the north side of the Bronx, the, entire, the north side of Manhattan, I'm sorry, is uh, a park. The Bronx side of the Har Harlem River is a, tr a train track, the whole way, it's an MTA line. And that paradigm is true everywhere in New York City. The best waterfront access points are right in front of the most affluent communities. And you can see that Brooklyn Bridge Park, the most expensive apartments in Brooklyn, are sitting right there. Uh, Riverside Park is right on the Upper West Side, in front of these fancy apartments. The uh, North River Wastewater Treatment Plant, which is a giant sewage treatment plant. Was, I don't know how well you all know New York City geography, but the was originally cited to go in Tribeca um, in lower Manhattan and was NIMBYed, you familiar with that term? Up the Hudson River, a bunch of different sites, and it landed at 138th Street in Harlem. And the Hudson River Greenway goes all the way along the west side of Manhattan, along the beautiful Hudson River, until it gets to the North River Wastewater Treatment Plant, and then it cuts in. That's the first time it leaves the river. I think that, that moment is sort of emblematic. And the, river, the North River plant came with a park on top, which is nice, but it's also a giant foul-smelling wastewater treatment plant, and it's the only part of the Hudson River that's inaccessible down at the, at the water level. So we think it's part of our job to focus our efforts in communities that are traditionally under-resourced to make the waterfront more accessible. And we do that through field stations. Field stations are remote sites in the few places where you can walk down into the water uh, th throughout the, the harbor. We have about a dozen sites under development. and those are small oyster reef installations that are accessible from shore. You can see this is our staff working at some of the staff and students working at some of those sites. One of the cooler stories is from Coney Island Creek. Coney Island Creek is one of the more polluted waterways in the city, probably the fourth most polluted waterway. And um, so we're not allowed to have adult oysters in here. So we restore oysters, and then we have to take them out. So you don't get the benefit of having adult oysters. They're not reproducing, but our oysters are seen as too dangerous to leave in the water because if someone was to eat them, they could get sick. So once they reach market size, we have to take them out. 
But we do that every year because it creates a programming opportunity. And we get, the, we get uh, classes of students, volunteers, and partner uh, CBOs who come down and monitor the oyster reef. And people accessing Coney Island Creek and taking water quality samples led to the discovery of a entire housing development that had never been hooked up to the municipal sewer. So you saw what we call dry weather discharge, which is when you see the presence of fecal coliforms, in, uh, so bacteria that's present in the human gut, in, in a waterway on dry days. That's not supposed to happen. But because people were accessing the creek and measuring water quality, so it raised the red flag, found the housing development, they were fined, and they hooked up to the sewer. And that's a cool story because it just shows that without access, no one would, ever, would have ever known about that. And it takes, you, know, you have to push forward and understand why you're not allowed to go in the water, how to make it safe in order to, to cause those positive changes. It's a neat graphic. <laughs> Students putting oysters in the, in the creek. This has nothing to do mm -hmm. with bacteria present in the human gut, but is, uh, this is our shell collection program. So we use oyster shells for reef building. And the only place to get oyster shells is from restaurants. So we don't have shucking houses anymore. All the, the oyster market is dominated by the half shell market. Oysters are opened at restaurants. So there's nowhere to get the shells, except if you get them from the restaurants, which is expensive and time consuming and labor intensive for the restaurant. But we, through a partnership with the Lobster Place, sponsored by Talisker Single Malt Scotch, we're able to run a truck around Brooklyn and Manhattan for soon to be five days a week and collect shells. We're actually back up to 50 restaurants. We're at the peak of 80, but after the pandemic, we're back up to 50. And we collect between four and 8,000 pounds of shell a week. All of that shell would have been put in black plastic bags, put on trucks, driven to West Virginia to be landfilled if we weren't taking it out. And to date, we've collected um, just over 2 million pounds of shell which I've been saying for a long time, because so it's been like 1.5, 1.6, and now we're actually over 2 million pounds. We use those shells as, as uh, the structures for our reef. So you can see these, these are oyster shells with tiny oysters on them. So we actually set these in tanks, which I'll show you in a minute, and then they go down in these reef structures. I can show you a little video so you can see what our larger scale installations look like. So the the uh, field stations are small community reefs, and these are the larger scale installations. And if you notice those shipping containers, you'll see them again a little later. Each one of those reef structures holds, holds between one and 300,000 live oysters, and they go down in these formations, as you can see here. So this reef is designed to have a kind of breakwater type effect. It's all subtitle, but then you have softer, more vulnerable installations inside there. So the, so the, the heavier steel structures can break some of the wave energy, and you can put um, just shell mounds and live oysters inside there. And this is our, our, largest, our largest installation at the mouth of the Bronx River um, to date. It's about 15 acres, and there's about 30 million oysters on it now. This is really hard to see. But the, um, this is one of those cages after a year in the water. And this is actually at Coney Island Creek. When we're taking them out. But what you see is, you can kind of see this, it's hard, but the, the mesh is here. This is the part that's out of the water, and this is the part that's in the water. And the oyster, sh the, those little tiny oysters grow out through the mesh and become the hard structure of the reef. You can't even see the mesh after a year. And the idea is the mesh is there to provide some structure until it degrades away over the course of five or 10 years. And then after that, the oysters themselves provide the structure of the reef. You can also tell from this picture all the interstitial space created by the oysters. So the, the ton of habitat for other animals. Like these guys. Some of the critters we find, uh, it's a red beard sponge, oyster toadfish, mud crab, blind seahorse, invasive tunicate, and um, uh, oyster drills, which are predatory snails which drill holes in the top of an oyster shell with, their, with a radula, melt the meat with sulfuric acid, and then suck out the juice. So they're kind of vicious little critters, but they're, uh, they're part of the ecosystem like everyone else. So we work to restore them. This is the number one water quality issue facing New York Harbor still. 
done a great job cleaning up the harbor. As I said, it's safe for swimming most days of the year. We practice scuba diving with teenagers in the harbor safely on a regular basis, so it is safe. Um, and But the number one problem still facing the harbor, the water quality in the harbor, are these combined sewer overflows. This is also happening in Boston Harbor. It's why oyster restoration is illegal in Boston Harbor. Um, so the, on regular dry days, the sanitary sewers go to the wastewater treatment plant and are dealt with fine. And then on wet days, it overflows directly into the harbor. And here, this is the Gowanus Canal. During um, a big rain event, and obviously the trash. Garbage all collected in that corner. I got it. Well, you'll see, you see how the uh, composition of the water changes when you get the, the runoff entering the Gowanus. Um, you just imagine this happening, uh, what that does to water quality in the harbor and to the accessibility of the harbor. So this is, you can imagine, there's a place like this in Boston Harbor somewhere. I don't know where it is. But the, uh, the Gowanus is cool because it comes into a neighborhood, which doesn't happen often in New York because most of the most of the city has a hard shoreline. But the, what, what happens is you concentrate a sewer shed on one water body, one water body and it, it concentrates and comes out that way. Um, but the, uh, this is why it's unsafe to be in the water within a few days of a rain event. This is why it's unsafe to eat oysters, unsafe to eat the fish. This is why we as New Yorkers are denied, and you as people who live near Boston Harbor, are denied access to the greatest natural resource you have is because it's contaminated with human waste, which is normally a problem you associate with develop, developing countries, but in the greatest city in the world, and in one of the perfectly good cities in the world, it's a, <laughs> sorry, it's a, <laughs> nothing against Boston. Um, that's the same problem. So this is our uh, aquaculture facility. So this is how we grow the oysters that we restore. We modified shipping containers as aquaculture tanks. So each one of these, is, they're 20 foot open top containers. They, uh, we modified them with food grade epoxy paint, air systems, plumbing systems, and heaters. And we can, we put 40 of these reef structures in, fill them up with water, add 10 million oyster larvae per tank. 10 million oyster larvae is uh, like the size of a squash ball. Like, a, like they're, they're very, very small and the, um, add those to each of the, the tanks. They swim around for three days, attach to the shells, and then we run the tanks on harbor water to feed the oysters for about 10 days until the oysters are big enough to go down on their, um, on their reef site. This has allowed us to go from an average of three and a half million oysters for the first five years of Billion Oyster Project to, to almost 30 million oysters in the last two years. So we're actually up to 75 million um, since since uh, last season, and we're planning to pa pass a hundred in the next couple months. So we only right now we only have nine hundred twenty five million oysters to go before we get to a billion. <laughs> um, another cool product of all of this focus on the waterfront is that developers were developing um, housing units in New York. It's become, it's now in their best interest to create innovative new shorelines. And that's because the, the general public are interested in accessing the water, interested in having clean water, interested in safe waterfront access. And so when developers, I mean, developers are also, can be innovative thinkers anyway and wanna do cool things anyway, but it's also to their benefit in getting their, their developments approved to have these kinds of things included. And so developers now will build private parks that are accept, that are open to the public all the time because they're able to rent their units for more if they have a park right there. And so they'll pay as the developer out of their own their own money to staff a park and operate a, a essentially a public park um, in order to make their units worth more money. And it's the same with these waterfront, these innovative waterfront projects. So we've had a really fun time working with this particular developers, Two Trees Management, as they've worked to create these totally innovative designs for the shoreline. What they're proposing to do is to make New York City a little bit smaller for the first time, carve back the land, and create a beach 
and these protected protective breakwaters that allow for safe access, uh, human-powered boating access, wading, eventually swimming, right in the East River. Um, so that's super cool, and it's been really fascinating to go to those community board meetings and the community meetings about the new developments and understand the, you know, who, who like, why communities are for certain developments and why communities are, are opposed to certain developments. And we can play our small role in um, adding oysters to whatever happens. Two more slides. So I talked about this a little bit at the beginning, um, about what my New York Harbor looks like. And I know for sure that if everyone in New York City knew New York Harbor like I know New York Harbor, all this stuff would stop immediately. Because it's, it's a totally different framing. It's like if you went in to go bring your family to Central Park one day and the gates were closed because it was full of human waste and trash. That would stop immediately. And that's what happens in the harbor every time it rains. But we don't think about it the same way. We don't think about it as our space. We don't think about it as a natural resource. We don't think about it as this beautiful, important, open space that we all have a responsibility to care for. This is a view of Manhattan um, from the Statue of Liberty, or from right next to the Statue of Liberty. The other thing you can really see here is how New York City is a city of water. Because four of the five boroughs are on islands. And when you think about the impacts of rising water levels, there's few cities in the world that are more vulnerable to those impacts than New York. And this is the East River. This is the most common view I have of New York Harbor because it's on the commute from the Brooklyn Navy Yard out to Governor's Island. And it's my one of my favorite places in the world, and it's absolutely spectacular. And so when next time you hear someone talking about the East River, just remember this is what it actually looks like. Uh, I think that's it for me. Thank you for listening. Um, <laughs> And now we have time for questions. You guys, here we go. We haven't done any um, work with inmates on Rikers Island. It has come up a few times. Um, so we, all, we have an enormous volunteer program where we work with thousands of volunteers each season and we build a lot of, it's a lot of low skill work that you can train someone to do quickly. And so we have it has come up that that would be an opportunity. Um, not that inmates are necessarily low skilled, but that it's something that can be trained, uh, you can be trained up on quickly. The other real opportunity there is, um, is restoring oysters around Rikers Island because it's a publicly owned land that isn't accessible to the general public. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, um, it's a big job. The <laughs> New York City Department of Environmental Protection runs all the water, manages all the water coming in and out of New York City. They have reduced the amount of sewer overflows by 80%, volume by 80% over the last um, you know, roughly 15 years. And that's made a big difference. The, the last 20% is much more expensive than, the, than that 80%. Um, it hasn't been that long. It wasn't, 1986 is when the North River Wastewater Treatment Plant was finished. So before 1986, the entire west side of Manhattan just went right out into the Hudson River. But the, um, what the, the strategies that have worked are, are um, you know, po uh, incentives to build green roofs to catch the water, right? Building these giant catchment basins before the wastewater treatment plant so the water gets uh, captured there and then treated during dry days and diverting water um, through bioswales, which are kind of like planted gardens next to the streets. So there's a, a variety of techniques to just slowly chip away at it, but the big ones are um, those big catchment tanks to hold the water. The system has a thousand times the capacity it needs for dry days. So we can catch up quickly if we could hold onto the water. Yes. The, uh, it started, okay, so it started with the idea to um, the, uh, so I, I met the founder of the New York Harbor School, this incredible 
uh, Dynamo, like incredibly energetic, um, amazing person who started Harbor School and Billion Oyster Project, and his name is Murray Fisher. And he uh, he had started the school. I, I moved to New York and was trying to trying to get into teaching and also trying to find a job. And the, I was sort of deciding between te- being a teacher or being an oyster farmer and going back to Fisher's Island. And I connected with Murray and he was like, well, we're sort of thinking we might need an oyster farming teacher. And so we talked about that as a, you know, basically sat down, he's like, so what do you think about getting Harbor School students to restore New York Harbor by, re- by restoring oyster reefs as a project? And that sounded like a great idea. Um, and so we just started doing it. Um, so I, I, I was a volunteer with Harbor School, then a substitute teacher, getting paid 16 hours a week and working 60 hours a week. And then uh, I got my teaching license, and taught aquaculture. And that whole time we were, there's a bunch of things going on. Harbor School was planning a move to Governor's Island. Um, we were starting all these other career and technical education programs. Harbor School gets no extra funding from the city or the state has a waterfront, working waterfront with five boats, um, scuba, you know, whole scuba program, and gets no additional funding. And so the nonprofit at the time wasn't Billion Oyster Project, it was New York Harbor Foundation. It was set up to support the school and raise private dollars to support the school. And the first reef, um, the first big grant we got for oyster restoration had written into the grant a compressor for the scuba, for the scuba program. Before that, a married couple taught the scuba program and they spent, uh, they would load the tanks into their 30 year old Honda Civic hatchback twice a week and drive it to Midtown to fill all the tanks up with Pan Aqua. It, it was incredibly labor intensive and we were able to use this reef restoration project as a way to get a compressor, a $50,000 compressor that installed in the school. And that was a big light bulb moment for the whole thing. Cause it was like, wait, we can use we, you know, we have a product here that's of value and we can use it to drive resources to the school. So when we first started, that was, our, that was what we did. We, we wrote these grants to restore oysters with students and we used that revenue to, um, to fund the programs at Harbor School. And a, a, another good story like, like that one is the, when the new Tappan Zee Bridge was built, they, uh, no one thought there were oysters that far north in the Hudson mm-hmm. River. So they, but when they're doing their environmental impact statement, they found all these oyster reefs right in and around the bridge. And so as part of the permit to build the bridge, they had to restore 13 acres of oyster reef habitat. And I think that, I think it was Billion Oyster Project then, but we we responded to the RFP and won it. And we said, okay, so in order to build these reef structure, we need a welding teacher and all of the welding tools to start a new welding program at Harbor School. And then we will build you your 600 um, you know, wire boxes filled with oyster shells. So it's a lot of that. It was a lot of sort of being opportunistic and then just kind of putting, putting things together. Um, but the, uh, I, th- I mean, yeah. Uh, does that answer your question? <laughs> So the great question, the, um, the harbor is really big and we're only talking about tiny little uh, piles of oysters in different places, even the multi-acre sites. But we look for places that the oysters will do well, so places where we see natural recruitment already. So on the edges, you'll see little oysters on the walls where the bottom composition is appropriate um, and the uh, tidal currents, there's, where there's an opportunity for retention of oyster larvae. And then it's all about where we can get permission it's really challenging to get permission to put to build oyster reefs. One of the hardest things we do is just get uh, is just cut through all the red tape to put the oysters in the water. Um, there's a, there's a lot of regulations. So every reef has permission from the Army Corps of Engineers, the Department of Environmental Conservation, the Department of State, the Coast Guard, the Port Authority, and each one of those uh, entities has a different set of permit requirements for each site. It's the fun stuff. Thank you.
people who believe in having something that has impact that goes beyond just putting a group of people together. Yeah, I think a lot of that's really hard to measure. Um, but you know, we have a lot of anecdotal stories, and there's some things you can look at. And we're also riding a wave. So the, the there's a there's a a wave of enthusiasm about oysters generally. People think they're cool, and there's a, 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 a like a, a lot of inertia moving back towards the harbor because the water quality is better, and and you know real estate is starting. Like fancy apartments are being built along the water's edge. So we're part of that movement as the water quality improves. But the way I think you can see our impact by looking at the uh, just sort of the number of the number of people who attend uh, public hearings about water quality issues and the number of concerned citizens who are interested in accessing the water and excited about it. And you see the, the Harbor School network grow through parents and friends and family to, to attend those meetings. That's a big deal. I, my favorite way to watch that change is just seeing the change on a student's face when they go from being a kid who doesn't have a connection to the harbor to someone who like really values that and is excited about it. But the other favorite thing is seeing the change on an adult's face when they're talking to a student and they realize that the student knows way more than they do. That's another fun one. <laughs> you guys probably see that all the time. <laughs> Yes. Um, so the oyster reefs were the primary navigational hazard early on in New York. Um, so that's absolutely true. Um, the average depth of New York Harbor is 12 feet. A, a significant portion of the harbor is under five feet deep. So there's this, uh, there's a ton of area to work with where there isn't a youth use conflict. Um, so if you got to a point where the harbor was once again filled with oysters, you'd start running into those issues, and you might have to dredge the shipping channels. But the shipping channels are actually just a tiny fraction of the whole area of the harbor. So we can certainly get well beyond a billion, and you know we can make a lot of progress towards restoring that landscape before we run into those use conflicts. And then you know if New York Harbor has to occasionally dredge oysters out of the shipping channels to keep them open, I'd be fine with that. What are you trying to say? <laughs> yeah, that's uh, that's our big strategic focus right now. So we've spent, you know, we launched Billion Oyster Project in 2014. We're getting towards 10 years old. We've developed all these different systems um, for restoring oysters and engaging students and all the stuff. So now our, our strategic planning work now is focused on how to get to the scale, how, how, what we need to change about how we're doing things to reach the scale we need to be at. For producing oysters, it's a pretty simple problem. We just need twice as many tanks. And so we just developed a new proposal where it's about a $2 million investment. Any of you want to help with that, you're more than welcome to. But, the, uh, but to, to buy another set of tanks, extend our, our setting season, and um, that, that will allow us to produce 100 million oysters per year. Which so, you know, in order to get to a billion, we need to get to 100 million per year at some point. And so that's what we're planning around. And it's the same kind of exercise, though it's far more complicated on the million people side. So we're trying to understand, you know, um, every teacher we train, every teacher who implements our curriculum counts 30 students. And so how many teachers do we need to, what, what's the balance of, of uh, people through our different programs? And what's the impact that our programs have on people depending on how they interact with Billion Oyster Project? So we have an exhibit in the New York Aquarium. The New York Aquarium sees half a million public school students every year go through their doors. If, if a student walks by a, a Billion Oyster Project exhibit in the aquarium, are they engaged with Billion Oyster Project? Probably not. But if they stop by and scan a QR code and then ask their teacher to participate in the program, then the teacher, you know, there's like all these different ways to look at impact. And so what we're doing is we're um, investing in our exhibits, different 
places throughout the city. We're investing in field stations. And the field stations are the big ones because you can, um, there's a lot of common interventions that make a big difference at different locations. So you have, and especially, um, you have a lot of waterfront sites where there's no safe, well-lit place to gather, no covered, you know, just like an open tent type situation, no running water, no bathrooms, no signs that say you can access the harbor, no fences like allowing you to come down. And so what we're doing at our field stations is we're developing a set of common interventions that we can do at a bunch of different sites to drive more people to the water. And, and then we're learning from those experiences. You know, we've had field stations for the last several years and like these ones, like how come, you know, 10 times as many people go to our Brooklyn Bridge Park field station than go to our Canarsie field station. Okay, how can we change that? And what, and, and um, you know, what do we need to invest in the site to drive traffic there? And so th that's a great question and what we're primarily focused on from a, like a, a strategic planning focus at Billion Oyster Project right now is like, what are the interventions and what's the scale that we need to be at to actually make our goals? So basically avoided your question entirely, but. Um, so I, lo lobster populations are, uh, are much more, lobster are much more sensitive to change in temperature than oysters. So the same species of oysters thrives from Labrador to Mexico. And so the warming itself is not a big deal for oysters because they, th that they're not susceptible to that like lobsters are. But there's a lot of associated issues like ocean acidification um, that, that can impact how oysters um, you know, different stages of their life cycle. And they saw that problem on the West Coast in a big way. Oyster farms were not able to grow oyster larvae because the, the, water, the pH of the water was too low. And so all of the hatcheries had a couple years where they couldn't produce any oysters. And then they actually ended up putting real-time pH buffers in their intake systems so they could have a sensor and it would buffer the pH on the way in. And that was an adaptation that was necessary on all these West Coast farms. We could never do that in the harbor. Um, the interesting thing with that is that it's an up, it's a factor, it's a result of upwelling. So because the water from on the west coast of North America comes up from the deep ocean when the when the surface water is pushed offshore, that water is actually the same water that was off of China during the Industrial Revolution, and so it's it's especially low pH water that's come under the ocean for 150 years and then comes up that way. It'll get to us eventually. Um, so the warming isn't an issue, but the pH could be a big deal. And, um, and there's other factors besides just um, ocean carbon concentrations that affect pH. So eutrophication, too, much, too many nutrients in the water can affect pH. And so it's something we're always looking at. All we can really do is, is see whether our oysters are reproducing effectively capture oyster larvae from the, that are free swimming and see if they're developing normally. And then the main thing that we do is we look for recruitment. And recruitment is when you see wild oysters um, attached to the, the shoreline. And that's the, that's the most significant indicator of whether or not we're having an impact or whether or not what we're trying to do is possible. Because when we started, there, that was incredibly rare to see, to see a, an oyster on a bulkhead somewhere. And over time, as we add more oysters to the system and as the water quality improves, you start to see that more and more throughout the harbor. And um, so that's really encouraging, but it's also, it's a, it's a, there's a complex relationship between where we put the oysters down, what the water quality is like, where the oysters are coming from, and where they're ending up. But if you see an area of shoreline with a couple hundred oysters per square meter in that area of shoreline, what that tells you is that there are countless other places that are not the perfect shoreline where those oysters are going and not finding the right spot. And so it's a little like tossing a handful of sand at a basketball court and expecting to land on a dime. 
in the middle. Like it's, it's, there's a lot of oyster larvae that are just dying every year because they're not finding the right substrate. Yes and no. Yes, we have seen um, an increase in the amount of wild or feral oysters that we see. And we can tell that because they're not on our shells. So they'll be on clam shells. At some of our sites, we'll put down oysters on oyster shells and clam shells without oysters on them. So if we see oysters on the clam shell, we know that those are um, new oysters. Um, and so we see that at some, of, at some of our sites and adjacent to some of our sites. But it's really hard to establish relatedness between the, and it's, it's pretty unlikely that, the, that oysters from a given reef will end up back in the same place. It's actually the, it's the most likely place for them to end up, but any one place is so incredibly unlikely that it's, they're probably not gonna end up there. <laughs> it's because they, they swim around for two weeks. And um, so you see, uh, there's there are some places in the harbor that are usually get more recruitment than other places. Some of those are near our reef sites. Some of those are not. Um, and then some of the uh, and we do see recruitment at most of our sites on our gear, but not at the density you'd need to have a self-sustaining reef. So the you know generally speaking, when we monitor our sites now, we'll see a few new oysters that have shown up. But you really need that hundred to two hundred per square meter to have a growing reef. And so up till now, and for the foreseeable future, all of our sites require maintenance, require additional live oysters to be added until we get the population up to more than it is. Yeah, and, and it's, it's a really important part of our communications work This to diners is indirectly through restaurants to diners at restaurants. Really hard to count. So we're, we don't, right now, this, we don't count those people. <laughs> but the, uh, it's also a fun part of our work is dealing with restaurants because restaurants like to have events. They like to promote the work that they're doing with us. They're, they're trying to be sustainable. It's a way that they can be more sustainable. They put Billion Oyster Project on their menu and you know, communicate to diners that they're collecting shells and that every oyster you eat could be the home to 20 new young oysters through the work of Billion Oyster Project. And so that's a really fun uh, uh, collaboration with restaurants. It's hard and expensive for restaurants to separate their shells. They, uh, and it's very labor intensive to collect them. It actually costs us 50 cents a pound to get a pound of oyster shells back to Governor's Island. Which if you get 2 million pounds of shell, it's a lot of money to collect the shells. Um, but the uh, because there's no other place to get them, and because they're the preferred substrate, and because of all the benefits of working with restaurants, it's worth it to us to do that, that collection that way. And the restaurants, they have, they, a lot of restaurants, will come, the restaurant staffs will come out for volunteer days. They all come, we do one big fundraiser every year and all the restaurants come and, and do like signature dishes for the restaurant. So it's a, it's a really fun partnership. Yeah. A very, very tiny bit. So um, oyster, oyster reefs are, are essentially carbon neutral. They're carbon, a growing reef is a carbon sink like a growing forest is a carbon sink. But a mature reef, like a mature forest, is carbon neutral. So, the, um, so you're not going to get, uh, and the shells have some buffering ability to, to help with pH. But oysters are not going to solve the problem of climate change, right? Through their normal existence. I would argue that the pro that looking for solutions for to solve the climate change to solve the challenges that the planet is facing outside of our own behavior is looking in the wrong place. 
And I think that the oysters, if we use them as, as we are building an oyster project, as a way to foster engagement with nature and enthusiasm for the nat natural world, can have a much bigger impact on changing human behavior than what they'll be able to do through their like normal existence in the water. Um, but I get that question all the time. Can oysters save New York City? Not, not on their own. I think that's just about our time. Thank you all.